Yeah. Start the meeting. Uh, 902 Wayside Cleanup Office Hours. And today is what? Thursday, March 25th. Uh, so uh, one of the th we had the advisory committee meeting uh, last Friday in lieu of this meeting on Thursday. Uh, thanks to all of you who came, uh, everybody else who missed it. It's available online. It's on YouTube already. Um, and all of the handout material is on the Wayside Cleanup um, webpage for the advisory committee uh, for that meeting. You can go there uh, and download that and go to the links to the things that are already online, like the grant uh, information as well. Uh, so all that's there. Uh, one thing I'm not sure whether we talked about it because it was Friday, it was a long time ago, uh, um, but it's related to what we were just talking about with Zoom software. Uh, we are going to try to uh, introduce and use uh, WebEx, uh, not WebEx, no, go to webinar. Go to webinar uh, for the next advisory committee meeting, uh, which will hopefully minimize the behind the scenes scrambling and anxiety uh, that that goes along with trying to do this using regular Zoom. Uh, and so we may try, maybe in a couple of weeks, try doing this meeting using that software. So we'll we'll give you at least a week notice, let you know, uh, put information on the the web page for the the office hours meetings. Uh, just so that we have a little experience using it before we actually hit the big advisory committee meeting. For those of you who sit in on the LSP board meetings, uh, this is the same software we use for that. Um, and in fact, it's partly because the department are uh, supporting our, you know, the not part of us, but related to us, LS uh, Board of Registration of Hazardous Materials Management Professionals, whatever they're actually called, uh, that uh, DEP bought the software license for that. So we have a license uh, and we'll, we'll try to use it. Uh, and also uh, EAIT would like to phase us out of using Zoom overall uh, and get us for our normal, you know, smaller meetings using Teams, which is of course the preferred, the preferred software of the mass.gov IT professionals. So, uh, maybe phasing out Zoom, so we'll see. By that time, we'll all be back in the office anyway. Um, so the advisory committee meeting, the, the big news this week, if you hadn't seen it, uh, is uh, the Department of Public Health released a long awaited study of childhood uh, uh, cancer rates in Wilmington uh, associated with the contaminated water supply, which was associated with the Olin chemical site, which is now uh, has been a Superfund site for a number of years now. Uh, if you haven't seen that, uh, they um, we have their links. Let me try sharing it without crashing everybody. Um, if you go to the DPH if you just search for environmental health investigations, Massachusetts, it will bring you to this page, which uh, I start here because you can sort by uh, reports by town. And as I was looking at this, I, I did realize that there are far more of these health assessments and reports than I actually imagined. Uh, and uh, so it would be interesting to, you, know, you may find it interesting to see what has been done in your town. Uh, nothing has been done in my town. But in the W's, uh, get down to Wilmington. So the Wilmington Childhood Cancer Study, uh, there's a lot of information here, including you know, for the, the shorter things, the executive summary and the, the press release that went out, but there's a lot of detail uh, about the study. Uh, so you might want to look at that. I, they did find an association between uh, levels of NDMA uh, or NDMA and TCE and the water supply uh, with elevated uh, cancer rates. Uh, so it, it is unusual. Uh, most of these uh, studies uh, often don't have uh, enough cases, don't have the statistical power to find statistically significant associations. Uh, so this one uh, stands out uh, because they did find that. Uh, uh, there, it was 
the technical aspects of this, including, uh, I'm gonna stop sharing just so I don't risk losing the connection. Uh, the technical aspects include uh, kind of detailed modeling of NDMA and TC concentrations throughout the Wilmington public water supply distribution system uh, to get estimated levels uh, and concentrations going back to uh, between 1990 and the year 2000. Uh, so there's a lot of information uh, kind of about that and the, the actual analysis of, of the data and um, and you know the uncertainty and confounding influences that uh, might be there as well. So it's an interesting read. They they rolled that out on Tuesday and Wednesday of this week, which I guess was uh, including yesterday. Uh, so that that's kind of interesting for the the short kind of where Wilmington stands, the, or the Olin chemical site stands now. I it. Uh, NDMA, once we uh, require them to sample for NDMA in the early 2000s, uh, sampling was then, it was found in the water supply. Uh, the wells that were affected were shut down fairly quickly in 2003. Uh, Wilmington at that time was hooked up to the MWRA. Uh, so they are you know, drinking, uh, you know, the public water supply has you know, clean water from the MD MWRA, those exposures were, are cut. There's still a lot of work being done uh, in Wilmington at Olin and EPA uh, for uh, you know, people following along. EPA is uh, going to be uh, issuing a rod hopefully uh, in the next month or so uh, in, in the near future uh, for some of the uh, final uh, re remedial activities, which will go on for quite a while. Uh, but the plans for kind of the next steps in some remediation out there. So ongoing, a lot of ongoing work, uh, but this is looking back at uh, kind of the exposures that were occurring in the past and what may have come from that. So it's, it's not, kind of not often we get this kind of research and report coming out at, at our site. So it's really interesting to see and reminds us that, you know, the, exposures that have occurred and may occur in the future you know, uh, sometimes do have uh, measurable impacts on, on people's health. So that was a big one. Um, I'm going to stop there. Those are, those are my announcements. Um, any, any questions or thoughts, anything on your mind? Uh, Liz and Gerard and Luke and everybody else from DEP, anything I forgot or should bring up? Paul, um, just a reminder uh, that there is a pre-grant meeting for the NRD um, firework work sites grants this evening. Yep. Uh, I, can put, I can put that information into the chat. Yeah, if you put it in the chat, if you go to the DEP website, uh, wayside cleanup uh, and scroll down to NRD. Oop, restoration planning grant opportunities. There should be information there, right? Yeah, public yep. notice for restoration. So that should give the information um, for that. Yep, there's a Zoom address right there. So if you go there, you can click on it and you can join us at 7 p.m., is it? 7 p.m. via Zoom. Bring your dinner, we don't mind. Anything else I've forgotten? You know, there are things like the PFAS sampling continues on. Uh, results are, are coming in. Um, did a BBA. Our PFAS meeting this week, um, which seemed to go well. You're all pretty quiet today. Maybe just because you're muted. Yeah. Yeah, we're still recovering from last Friday's extravaganza, Paul. That's what it is. Paul, which, Paul? which software? Oh, mine's quick. Which software nope. did you say you're migrating to? Or... Uh, we're going to try because we have the license in house and so no added expense. Uh, um, go to webinar. 
So it's the higher level version of GoToMeeting. And that, like I said, the LSP board has been using that. And the, the benefit of that is having, uh, my limited experience, uh, being able to have a panel, a group of people that are participating and talking and interacting like the advisory committee uh, and DP staff, and then having more of an audience that is watching and listening and able to uh, interact by chat and we can selectively you know, pull people in. Um, so what we're, we're trying to do that last Friday using Zoom, but doing it manually and like trying to frantically <laughs> unmute all of the advisory committee members when we wanted a, a discussion. And th this should be easier. Uh, because it's designed specifically. I think it actually is. That's how, you know, LSPA runs its courses. But speaking of LSPA courses, so um, Steve so Zemba great. and uh, so we did the uh, short forms yesterday. And uh, Steve Zemba had added in uh, his being known as Mr. Excel to himself and others, I guess, um, had added in PFAS to the short forms. So we did a PFAS problem and a case study. But the question was, uh, is the department planning on updating the short forms to add PFAS in? He cautioned us that this is not an official sanctioned version, just what he had done. Hacking our short forms. Um, I, yeah, I, I've, I assume I'll, I'll ask Nancy specifically if we haven't already asked, but. Um, and you could always ask Steve for his copy and then she could just review it, save her some work. Well, we would want to post our, our copy. You know, no, I'm just saying. So yeah. Start uh, with his and. Yeah, uh, anyway. yeah I, I, I hack it all the time. Um, to answer questions like that. So I probably have a PFAS version uh, huh, there you go. sitting on my, my hard drive somewhere. Um, but yeah, um, yes. That, that, Thank you. That hasn't already make a note of that. Yeah. So any, any interesting results from that um, case study problem? Well, it was just, uh, so oh, they on. gave us a list of data and uh, from a monitoring well nearby, no distance specified, a private well. And using the short form, it came up to a significant risk, but not above imminent hazard. It was 36 parts per trillion, but enough to suggest that the appropriate action would be to test the private well. So, yeah. Oh, one, one thing I was going to note about the uh, Wilmington in NDMA, uh, for uh, those of you who may be unfamiliar with NDMA, uh, if you think the standard for PFAS is low, uh, NDMA was kind of the original uh, kind of raise your eyebrows and blow your hair back. Um, the one in a million risk level for NDMA in drinking water is, is less than a part per trillion. Uh, you know, vagaries on how you actually calculate it, but you know, it's, it's less than one part per trillion. So down in very low numbers. Blow your hair back uh, being distinguished from MDMA or M and or MDA, which are more commonly known in raves, but. <laughs> yeah, we won't go that way, down that route. Um, yeah, so, okay, any, any, any other issues, topics? Come on, I'm running dry. <sighs> Tell us more about NDMA. I'm not familiar with that compound. What was what was it used for, and what what was uh, it doing? So with, did they manufacture it at all in chemical? Well, I, I think the cool thing about NDMA, which is n dimethylamine, uh, is uh, you most commonly see it, well, I, I don't mean most common, but you, you don't most commonly see it because most people don't go looking for it. But it is a, a byproduct of a number of um, 
various chemical reactions, including not kind of not surprisingly, uh, water you know, treatment systems that use uh, polyamine alum treatment. You can get low levels of NDMA there as as well. Uh, so it, I, I believe at Olin, it was a product of the various um, chemicals that were released you know, by, by Olin and the NDMA formed in the aquifer. Uh, one, one of the kind of interesting, there's the DNAPL at, at Olin uh, that uh, of containing various, various chemicals, including uh, high levels of ammonia, um, I believe, and, and other things. And it kind of in that DNAPL soup, the, I believe the NDMA uh, formed. So it wasn't a chemical that was released. It was a something that that happened in the environment as a result of what was released. So, which is probably one of the reasons why it took a little bit longer to actually figure out it was there because you you start with what's released and and look for that. Um, so so Paul's breakdown product essentially is that what you're saying? I'm I'm not sure it's. I would view it as a breakdown product as it's a result of kind of various chemical reactions. Um, breakdown, break up, uh, put together, yeah. So, so it, a TCE site that's a drinking water source, no, that doesn't mean you got no, the, 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 the TCE is just a, you know, it, it was a co-contaminant. Okay. TCE was, was there. Uh, in the public water supply, uh, but the the NDMA formed, I believe, from the, the ammonia and the other materials that had been released. So it's you you throw you kind of indiscriminately let's use that word are uh, dump materials into a lagoon and it goes down into the the bedrock and the aquifer and those materials mix together and sometimes you. You, you end up with things you didn't expect. Not because it's a linear breakdown product sequence, but it's the reaction of different unrelated chemicals to form something new. Yeah. Uh, and that's you know, harder to predict. I mean, you can predict, you know, if, if you start out with PCE, you, know, you can look at the sequence of you know, breakdown products and you know, at, at some point, you know, look at the mixture and you can figure out how long it's been there and what, you know, what the actions were to get the mix that you now have. But this is kind of working in a different direction, unrelated chemicals combining together. This is Linda with a question that makes me um, ask about landfills with that kind of uh, deterioration or breakdown of all kinds of things result in that kind of chemical. Um, if you have the right mixture of things, uh, probably yes. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hesit hesitating because you know, the, this is kind of opening up the, the bigger door of when you have soups of chemicals, uh, what what do you look for and how do you look for them? And uh, and so you begin running up against kind of what we're finding with, with PFAS. You know, 10 years ago, nobody was looking for PFAS because you didn't think about it. Uh, and as we learn more about it, you and as we have better analytical tools, you know, the more you look for something or or have the tools to look across things, uh, the the more that you find and know, uh, so I think any any of these mixtures of contaminants um, you know, that isn't just okay. You have a dry cleaner emitting PCE. You have you know, won't say pure product, but you know a a known waste that's you know pretty much all PCE going into the ground and then migrating and then something happens to it. Like I said, you can somewhat predict what it's going to look like down gradient and after a number of years. But if you start with a mixture of, of chemicals, uh, whether because you're, you're throwing a bunch of them into a lagoon and they're mixing and migrating together, 
or in the case of a landfill where uh, a landfill may contain you know lots of unknown uh, material and breakdown products from the waste that goes in there. So the the leachate that comes out of a landfill um, you know, is is going to contain a wide range of, of stuff. Some of which we look for, some of which have you know analytical methods that target them and standards that we can use to be able to quantify them. But if you look at you know, and at those analytical methods, you're going to find our uh, unknown peaks are. Uh, tentatively identified compounds that you, you don't have standards for, but you, you think you know what they are. Uh, there are a lot of things that don't get quantified, but you know that they are there. Um, you know, with PFAS, we, you know, we quantify you know, you know, two, then six, then 14, then 27, but there are all of these other peaks that are there that are perfluorinated compounds that uh, depending upon the method you're using, you don't quantify, but you know there are other things there. Uh, and that's, you know, that, that is something that, uh, you know, we don't necessarily, you know, talk as much about as, perhaps as we should, that when we do these analyses and we, we're looking for things, uh, often we are bound and limited by the ana analytical methods that we choose and the standards that we have. And, um, and you know, sometimes you end up with situations where you, know, you find unknown peaks in the chromatogram uh, and you, know, the, you then follow up on it and that leads you down a path. You see that there's something there, you don't know what it is. So it leads to uh, more investigation, figuring out what it is and that leads you uh, wherever it leads you. Uh, but much of the time, you're seeing mass there that's kind of indistinguishable, and it would be hard to actually tease out what's actually there. A shorter answer to Linda's question is that, as a friend of mine once said in the landfill business, landfill leachate is the proverbial primordial soup, and he would not be surprised to see new life occurring. <laughs> that That's kind of... Well, I was going to say that's an optimistic view of it, but I'm not sure. Is it friendly life? We might not know. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's the primordial soup. Yeah, I like that. It's, it's the chicken soup on your stove. The primordial chicken soup. Chicken soup smells a lot better. Thank you. <laughs> and probably healthier for you. Uh, undoubtedly. Oh, I, mean, I had uh, a thought for Liz. Uh oh, I'm listening. Um, so, a lot of emphasis in your waste site cleanup advisory committee meeting last week on the commissioner's environmental justice outreach, and um, not taking credit. I'll just say I'm pushing the LSPA for the LSPA to consider, evaluate how to provide a Spanish language. Uh, well, pick a language, but maybe Spanish would be the first one to try a uh, language version of its website to be able to communicate its information to some EJ communities. And I wondered if one of the things that um, you are considering is having the DEP website be available in languages other than English to maybe facilitate contact with the EJ communities. I think uh, I think the group has discussed that uh, the the EJ group, the internal group, is meeting uh, next week. So I can uh, bring that up again and bring an answer back to you on that. Okay, I'm just curious. I mean, some of the thoughts that were expressed are, you know, in that group that you described, I guess there's no, that's an internal group, there wouldn't be any representatives from outside. In, yes, like the LSPA, right. for example. That's right. <laughs> but you know, um, kind of on a related topic, one thing um, we've, we've done very little of so far, but we've tried to figure out um, what documents we have that are public facing that we should translate up front. And 
Uh, we've done a few things on occasion when, um, like a fact sheet, when uh, the EJ community uh, identified had a certain language, we would translate those on a case by case basis. But we have some more general documents, for example, how to hire an LSP or um, you know, back information generally about the, the 21E program um, or risk issues that um, we wanted to flag the ones that would be you know, most important to translate. So we'd be interested in input on that on your end in terms of what you think, the type of information we should focus on for those translations. Yeah, and I, I think there'd be interest in, you know, what does the department feel the most appropriate language to start with would be, I mean, we're guessing Spanish, but that's just a guess. And, you know, there, and there might be resources available to help or something. Um, the, the concept of whether or not this could fall under the purview of the WES grants was a question. Oh. There are companies that do translations of technical documents. Yes, there are. So TransPerfect is one. We have, the, the state has a contract so um, we can get translation services and we also have a DEP language bank. So our staff that are multilingual mm -hmm. will um, take a first stab at translating documents. Um, so we have been doing that, but I think for the most part, it's been um, case by case where we had a particular need. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, just uh, thought was that, you know, maybe again, to try to reduce barriers and, and I would throw out again um, that, you know, there are, there are some LSPs who have indicated an interest in, you know, if there was a way to help. So I think, you know, if the department had suggestions of things that the LSPA or the LSP community might do to facilitate the further environmental justice uh, that might be that would be helpful, um, but you know again I think there there was there was some interest uh, at least from several LSPs on the idea of representing or being available to uh, community groups um, who might be interested in what goes on at the at the advisory committee meeting and then you know reporting back to them carrying their concerns to the committee reporting back to them etc. Yeah, that, I, I, that's kind of interesting because um, Liz mentioned that DEP has a language bank. So what we did was kind of solicit among the DEP staff to find out mm -hmm. who, who are a bilingual uh, and who would be willing to kind of, uh, provide translation services and support kind of across programs. Um, so if you, you know, speak, if we have somebody say, for example, you know, who can speak Portuguese in the Southeast region, uh, and we need translation in Northeast, you know, we'll know who to reach out to and in what program and, and, and that. Yeah, so, we should do that as well. Yeah, yeah they, they, that may be something the LSPA might want to look at is uh, find out who among the members, you know, are bilingual who would feel comfortable and be willing to, to do that, um, you know, for things like, I, and, and what you suggest is kind of attending advisory committee meetings and then you're providing a summary you know, not only to the LSPA but to the, the broader community about what's going on kind of reporting back you know, in another language would be would be interesting okay well I will I'll continue to advocate for that thank you yeah, and that that that's where our language bank has worked really well particularly for you know quick turnaround you know, we need this we need this now as you know some of the things you know, end up being, you know, we have uh, common things like um, boil, <clears throat> sorry, boil orders in the, the drinking water program that, you know, once you find out about it, you have to get that stuff out immediately. So we have them translated into the common languages where to go, but sometimes you end up with a community and the, the uh, GIS, Mass GIS site has kind of maps of common languages in in various you know, Massachusetts. Oh, okay. And it, it's easy to find. You know, there are a lot of places you can go. Massachusetts is, a, is one of them. Um, 
but you can look at you know, the community where your site is or you know, where a, a boil order is. And if we find we don't happen to have you know, that already translated, then the language bank is a, a first cut at, at getting that information out really quickly um, before we, it, we polish it with the uh, a outside translation service. And even the outside translation services, you know, it's good to have a native speaker uh, then read what you get back. I, I agree. And, and, you know, again, I'm only familiar with this through Scoutsly. Scouts and Red Cross both do the same thing with language banks, but particularly, you know, when you're going out to a community and you're trying to do a home fire campaign, put in smoke detectors in houses or something, you can have, you know, tran you know, language, literature in the language, but it helps to have a native speaker to talk to the people and explain why you're there, what you're doing. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Another thing uh, DEP does is on on certain documents or important documents uh, directed at someone who may not be English speaking is they put a, a one page in there with a with a, a flag document flag representing where that language is is spoken and and um, saying saying in in that language that you can have this document translated so ah, okay. Is that through like Google Translate or something, or is that a request that they put no, in? It would be a request. Yeah, yeah. they would re request that back of Mass DP and we'd arrange okay. for that. Hmm. Oh, just, just keep thinking about those ideas. Think it's a good initiative by the commissioner and something I personally, not representing the LSPA, but personally think it's something that the LSPA should support. So I will keep advocating for it. Yeah, and any suggestions about from the wayside cleanup perspective, or I guess even broader DEP wide, of common documents that you know, you guys might hand out to people or direct people to that you think are useful. You know, uh, that it would be good for us to have different versions of uh, in different languages. Um, it would it would be nice. Or uh, to have that, you know, and we're you know, working towards building up that library, and we should. You know, for some of them, get them up on, on the web where we have them rather than kind of wait for people to request them. And then the, the larger question of getting the entire DEP website, you know, into translated in different languages. Um, I'll, I'll bring that up with our webmaster as well. I'm, I'm not sure what the kind of technical or structural issues are with that because we're, we are one, huh. one small part of the overall mass.gov website and much of what goes on out there on the web, on the website is beyond our control. No, I could see it would be hard to like translate all the documents and stuff like that, but you know, maybe, you know, but even, maybe trying to figure out what would be first and, you know, like finding, right. you know, 21 e sites in your neighborhood, right. for example, might be right. a high priority. That, that that pa that page, the find out about you know contaminated properties in your neighborhood or whatever we call it. Uh, I mean that's the one page I always direct people to because it has that it has that guide to the wayside cleanup program. You know if yeah you're unfamiliar, start here. Um, so overall, it's you know that page probably answers more most of people's initial questions. So getting that page in the, the documents linked to it translated probably would be a good first step. So there's a question I got in the chat. It might be interesting to know if anyone here has experience with PIP plans that are in other languages or have required translations at your sites. Uh, I, I, I think Southeast and Gerard had to leave uh, for the, his weekly regional PFAS call. Um, I, I know that Southeast has had um, worked at sites where uh, there have been things, uh, other languages like Chinese, uh, Mandarin that have been used uh, both for document translations and, I, and possibly the PIP plans, but certainly uh, Zoom call translations. Um, but I'm not sure that the PIP plans themselves have been translated. I don't know. But if you have any experience and we can learn from it, we'd like to. Paul, on the uh, 
in the listening sessions with DOR, did any any uh, items of particular interest come up? Or just sort of. Um, items of particular interest are. I mean, they were all interesting, Larry. Of um, the are uh, in Liz and Luke can help me out on on this. Um, I think there were. I mean, first, of all, there were a lot of kind of reinforcing comments on the specific DOR regulations, uh, even though the listening session was supposed to be kind of a bigger picture, but kind of common threads included kind of the the lack of predictability, uh, the lack uh, the um, the timeliness or lack thereof of the the review process, um, uh, lack of consistency uh, that appears. To be there. I'll, I'll copy up by all this. You know, we're hearing from the tax credit recipients and applicants, and all that. So the, you know, that's you know, the, the comments are coming from a certain direction. Uh, so it's all perceived, alleged. Um, but consistency, predictability, timeliness. Uh, there are certainly concerns about the application of the the regulations, kind of uh, retroactively. Uh, Concerns about the appeals process uh, and kind of the review, the de novo review that that uh, entailed. Um, there were um, kind of concerns about the, I would say, the concerns that the people reviewing the applications should have a good knowledge of the MCP and how it works. Um, the you know, there had there were some suggestions, for example, that you know the LSPs could certify this, and you know, we should rely upon the LSPs. Uh, I believe uh, one gentleman you know to stress the you know how much goes into reviewing these documents and the the accumulated knowledge that LSPs have uh, turned and, and showed a bookcase full of uh, binders. <laughs> I'm trying to egg him on to show us a bookcase full of binders. Um, yeah, that'll do it. <laughs> I'm at home. Uh, um, uh, and anything else? Uh, and there, what I, I guess the people were kind of reinforcing that it was kind of. It was working well, but over the past several years, it seems to have slowed down. Uh, it takes longer. Uh, there are fewer applications, uh, fewer um, tax credits given out per year, and and some question of whether that is just a result of uh, kind of looking at it closer in the greater complexity, or whether it was kind of an intentional slowing down. So I, I think those are some some of the big things that we heard. Uh, Liz, Luke, any anything I missed? Or for those of you that provided test me testimony, anything I missed? I think that's a good summary. I mean, I think you know, for me, one of the big sort of conceptual divides in all of these discussions is, is between process and substance, right? So how how are these credits reviewed? How should how should they be reviewed? Um, who reviews them, what kind of expertise do they have on the one hand, and substantively, you know, what, what should be credited, what kinds of activities, what kinds of excavation activities, uh, what kinds of uh, remedial activities uh, should be credited, and when do those activities begin to appear or to be uh, more uh, a development type activity. Yeah, so there, there will be uh, more meetings of the uh, interagency working group uh, moving ahead. I'm, I'm not sure exactly kind of when, when they or we, I guess, as being part of it, uh, will have a product or recommendations coming out, or, or for that matter, where those recommendations go. Uh, you know, it's being directed and run by uh, the Executive Office of Administration and Finance. Uh, 
we are mere participants. Do you have a sense of whether they're moving toward uh, continuing regulation or moving to new legislation? I, I, I don't think it's necessary. So far, I don't think it's a kind of a directed move in, in any, towards any particular approach. Uh, I think it's more a trying to get straight what the issues are and what no. the solutions are, and then going wherever that may lead. Uh, you know, I, I think it was from, you know, from the beginning, it, um, I think the working group was supposed to, you know, not be narrowly focused on the DOR regulations, but willing and able to take a broader picture of, you know, what are the goals of the, the tax credit? You know, how is it working? How is it not working? And is there, is there anything can be done, you know, and provide the organizational uh, support across state government in order to kind of make changes that would appear to be necessary. You know, obviously, you know, if you break up into the world as, as we do for all of our you know, program changes, there are things that can be done just programmatically. There are things that require our reg changes, and then there are things that require statute changes, and that it gets progressively more difficult and less in our control the, uh, the more you, get, you know, go from program up to statute. So, to the extent that you know, th there are program changes that can be made, those are faster and easier to do. Uh, and, and would I guess represent the low hanging fruit, but you know, if there are potential statutory changes to go off on the other end uh, that might be recommended, then you, know, you have to figure out also what, what do you do in the short term because the, any statutory changes wouldn't, would be unlikely to take effect for quite a while. So, you know, and, and there are still your know, projects that are in the pipeline that, that need to be addressed and, and you still need to address the consistency, predictability, predictability timeliness aspects of that. There's no yeah. silver bullet. No, and once you toss it back to the legislature, you have no idea what's gonna come out the other end. Right, and yeah, that's their, that's their prerogative, I think. And, you know, we we interpret what they they give us, um, and try to make it work, and that's uh, that's our you know task right now is, is twofold I guess try to make it work you know given what we we have now and and then also if it changes you know try to make that work. Thanks. Yeah. All of which say I don't know what's going to come out of it yet. But if the message was heard that you know it it works, it's important for the development community. It's certainly important from your DEP's perspective to uh, get cleanup done at sites that have been sitting there unaddressed for a while. Um, so I think everybody agrees about the utility and the effectiveness of the tax credits. Uh, and Marilyn asked the the. <laughs> the, the eternal question, is that a pipe organ in Luke's background? And the answer is yes, yes. The house, I, I can ask for Luke here, the house came with the pipe organ. <laughs> Don't you wish your house came with a pipe organ? I knew there had to be some kind of story behind it. <laughs> That's a pretty amazing background. Of all the Zoom backgrounds I've seen, that one's totally awesome. Thank you. <laughs> The, the craziest thing is there's more than one pipe organ in the house. <laughs> I was He's saving that for another uh, <laughs> meeting. <laughs> when, when he showed up with a different pipe organ in the background. Yes. Okay, so I have to ask this question. On your 2021 bingo cards, did anybody have ship blocking the Suez Canal? <laughs> <laughs> I came close. I, I went for the alliteration and I had catastrophic, catastrophic Cape Cod Canal kayak collision. So I, I, I came close, didn't quite get it. Wow, no, that was, that was, that was a piece of, of news though. That was uh, pretty interesting. 
It's like, what else can go on in the go wrong in the world? Okay, well, if if we have nothing else, we'll we'll end on catastrophic canal catastrophes. And closures. Closures, yep. Okay. Thank you all. So we'll see you next week our Thursday at 9 a.m. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Interesting discussions. Yeah. Bye. 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 Thanks, Paul. Thanks.